Hello and welcome to the Science of Psychotherapy. Thank you so much for joining us here. Once again, uh, we're going to be going through some aspects of our book, The Practitioner's Guide to the Science of Psychotherapy. And I'm here with Richard Hill. Hi, Richard. Yes, it's fantastic. I'm uh, now co-author uh, instead of managing editor. So, That's right. Uh, no, but it's great. So there, there's a lot of areas in the book. And so the idea is for us to just go through and give a little bit of a talk through uh, and uh, hopefully that helps you get a more uh, comfortable understanding, a more, a more humanistic understanding. And so certainly it is. We, we, we want to look at these, these subcortical divisions. Uh, the, mm. It's an interesting area, the sub, subcortical stuff. Uh, now, I've got a few things. What do you got to say there, Matt? Yeah, so we are, we're going deep into the brain. There's a lot going on here. Now, we use a lot of words to describe various discrete sections of the subcortical regions of the brain. Um, probably um, Brodman's uh, in the early 1900s was the one that labeled a lot of the parts and we still use those names today. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out was that, that nothing really is uh, operating in a discrete location. Uh, we might get that impression when we're talking about this region or that region, but everything is massively interconnected. Um, it, it really is a massive network. So, so just be careful as we're talking about particular uh, areas of the brain, um, that none of them act independently. So that's just one thing to keep into mind. Yeah, I think uh, bring it in the context, just look at the body, like we get nerve bundlings we have bundles and and connections and and, and areas that seem to have interactive and interconnected processes but we have that all through our body in our viscera yeah. we have we have nerve uh, we have cellular bundles uh, that we call a liver and cellular bundles that we call the kidneys but they're all interconnected by other other processes and none mm. of them are isolated and separate and uh, uh, not related to the functioning of others so it's, Absolutely. it's a little bit of a broad bow but roughly the body works on on making the most of getting collections of elements and in the brain their neurons in order to create functional effectiveness. So the first one that comes up here is uh, the thalamus. Richard, what's the thalamus all about? Now, the thalamus is a fascinating uh, uh, sort of look without going into the deep, deep technicals, because you could go into the book and have a look at yep. some of the breakdowns. But let's look at what, what it helps us understand. It's a distribution uh, network or a center, it's a distribution hub. And information, a lot of information, particularly visceral and sensorial information, comes up into the thalamus and off it goes all over the place and throughout the brain. And the thalamus, uh, when you look in the book, you'll see how it's made up of a number of different sort of compartments or areas that do different uh, different processes. And, and by looking at that, you can get some understanding of how our example in the introduction, which uh, I keep not telling the mystery of, but it's obviously to do with the thalamus, but how we can have damage to some parts of the thalamus and still have yeah. functions um, that, uh, so it's not a, a, one, a one meets all, but we have the thalamic burst, which comes from when our, uh, we have a, a burst through the system from the reticular formation that just lets the cortical, cor the cortex know suddenly and quickly about what's going on in the, the uh, sensorial and the visceral areas coming up from the body. Now, I've got a great quote um, from the book here. It says, if the brain works like an orchestra, our results suggest that the thalamus may, it, may be its conductor. This is um, from a Dr. Michael Halassa. He says, it helps ensembles play in sync by boosting their functional connectivity. Yeah, and it's, and it's from bottom up and top down as well. So the, the thalamus is a... It sits there and it's uh, susceptible to um, to stroke. So it's uh, you right. know with some of those things, uh, some of the veins of Galen can directly affect it. So it uh, you suddenly find dysfunctionality can be in the thalamus. Now below the thalamus, unsurprisingly, is the hypothalamus. <laughs> Yes, it's very depressing, I think, the name. So hypo, you're not as much as the thalamus. <laughs> but, it, but it certainly is. I mean, the, the hypothalamus um, has got this sort of, uh, if the thalamus uh, broadly distributes and broadly conducts, the hypothalamus has more specific actions and more specific yep. activities, sort of it's a smaller version. And we've got a very fundamental as, uh, element that the hypothalamus is central to. 
Yes, so it's connected to the pituitary gland and it's very, very critical when it comes to hormones and hormone release. And this is connected to something that we want to touch on right now. It's called the HPA axis. Yes, and this is just one of the hormonals, and this is the hormonal shift and change and, and messaging that occurs when we come under stress, some kind of disturbance. Mm -hmm. Now, when we do come under stress and we have uh, excessive amounts of stress, we have cortisol surging through our body and cortisol isn't kind to the hypothalamus, but there is uh, a regulatory process that happens, which turns down the amount of cortisol that's flowing through our body. And, you know, that, that sort of preserves the system. But if we have continual cortisol going through our body, because we're continually under stress, it does damage the the mechanism that controls the cortisol. So Richard, yes. what, is the, what happens then? Well, this is what's so fascinating about it is that this is the problem with chronic, uh, chronic negativity, negative behaviors or, or um, uh, disrupted behaviors mm -hmm. is because what we're evolutionarily um, experienced with is we cope with the, 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 the threat, the danger, the thing that upregulates our HPA axis. Um, or we die. And mm. so what we tend to do in modern times is, is, is what Robert Sapolsky said, we're, we're, we're designed for, or organized, I don't like designed because that shifts us into other areas, but we're organized around the, the big woolly bear jumping out from behind a rock, not for the 30 year mortgage. <laughs> so chronic illnesses, chronic pain, chronic stress, chronic HPA axis function leads to hyperactivity, hyperarousal into anxiety and hypoarousal into depression and areas of, uh, that we look at there. And now we move on to one of our other fun little fellas who is involved in a lot of things, but one of it is, let's start off with its regulatory impact on the HPA axis. And we're now talking about the hippocampus. And the hippocampus has a series of receptors, what we call glucocorticoid receptors. And they uh, receive and are able to uh, uh, know that the body has plenty of cortisol, the, the glucocorticoid running around the system. And it then messages to the, uh, to the uh, hypothalamus say, it's okay. We've got this stuff going, cortisol's up. We're getting all adrenaline, we're running. Uh, you can calm down now. So these regulatory uh, processes are just example how interconnected all these seemingly discrete elements of the brain are. Yeah. Now, now, since you've mentioned the hippocampus, let's talk a little bit more about that. Because it does a lot more. Absolutely. Go yeah, for it. Yeah. So, so the hippocampus is involved in memory formation and it is involved in us being able to put together the emotional response of time and place and context. And as we were just talking about, when these structures are, are, are damaged in some way because of excessive stress, we can get a little dissociated between time, place, and, and, and emotional memory. And that is a classic feature of PTSD. This yes, this is exactly right. The nature of the hippocampus, in uh, because it's in the temporal lobes, effectively, it is related to temporal perception and also spatial perception. I mean, one of the, the, the fascinating things is uh, uh, English taxi drivers, London taxi drivers, who have to learn these, these maps, have to learn, they're not allowed to carry, I, don't know, I suppose they do now, but they used them to be, their hippocampus would enlarge. And people who uh, do a lot of, uh, of memory and thinking work, their hippocampus enlarges. And those who are under lots of stress and lots of uh, overwhelm, and also when they perhaps get some uh, brain, uh, brain issues, uh, the amygdaloid buildup and so on and so forth, the hippocampus can be actually reduced. So long periods of stress reduces the hippocampus. And it really is the organizer of memory uh, for at least two years. And, yeah. and we know this because people who've had um, a hippocampal uh, removal, uh, HM was a wonderful example, have, are not able to lay down new memories and uh, tend to be able to remember from about two years beforehand. Quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. so that memory is obviously then consolidated in the cortex. 
Fantastic. Now, another area that we're, we're not really going to focus on that much today, and that's the amygdala. It's had a lot of airplay, um, and we can point you to to other things that you, where we've talked about the amygdala. Um, but maybe, Richard, we can just tease out one or two points about the amygdala. Yeah, well, I, I know you've got a couple, so I'll, I'll see if I can point some, some slightly different ones. Uh, What's important about the amygdala, and we've got some fabulous podcasts with Joseph Ledoux, who's actually done the work, and he says, oops, yeah. I'm sorry, folks, I think I let you think it was about the emotion of fear, but it's not. It's, a, um, it's a, an area of the brain that takes in information that is uh, large and excessive, and particularly that is dangerous. It also has heightened, uh, it's, it's actually where you have a uh, recording of, um, of memories of, of great passion and, and great excitement, but it's, it's really a, a, a danger uh, area, a, a, a keeping you safe area. So when the amygdala fires up in response to what it believes to be a, a danger, and you, you're gonna talk about those sort of things in a second, that will go off and fire up the hypothalamus to send it off into the HPA axis. And it will also um, fire up in relation to uh, areas in the prefrontal cortex because the, the amygdala really, the prefrontal cortex really emerged out of the amygdala, whereas the parietal is where it really emerged out of the hippocampus. And so um, the, the amygdala is very important in keeping us safe in what uh, uh, a part of the area of the process that uh, Stephen Porges calls neuroception, that yeah. that scanning of the environment for safety. But yeah. now over to you, Matt, for some of the ways in which it does this, this encoding of well, uh, experiential stuff. Yeah, so, so just very, very basically, I like to think of it as a pattern recognition system, mm -hmm. a sophisticated pattern recognition system. Um, it seems that some things are uh, rather naturally uh, encoded and some things are learned and uh, the left and right lobes of the amygdala have different ways of, of doing it. I mean, different sensitivities to different things. Mm. Um, but generally it's a pattern recognition system. So it's, it, so when you, when you see uh, like the shape of a snake, your amygdala recognizes that pattern. If you see anger on a face, your amygdala recognizes that particular pattern and then sends signals to other parts of the brain to process and then respond. So fear that so the amygdala isn't necessarily the center of fear it sends a signal that it recognizes a pattern associated with what then our higher cortical regions will then interpret as something to be fearful of yes it it it, it creates the 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 neurobiological activity that stimulates the uh, uh it's 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 a good idea to have some response to this Yes, um, yes, and yeah. and and it's quite fascinating. And this is we have this negative bias because the amygdala will see something coiled up, and we'll go, "Whoa, that's a problem." And and as uh, when we're talking about, I think Robert Sapolsky talks about this. Uh, so does Joseph Ledoux. Uh, we we are much better off um, thinking that a, a coiled up rope could be a snake than the other way around. So we have a negative. We have. Um, again evolved and uh, we become organized around being safer to and more uh, likely to survive by being having a defensive um, a defensive edge yeah. and uh, you know and I know a lot of people that there's that that were called thrill seekers that they have reduced um, activity of the uh, of the uh, amygdala so they have a, they mm -hmm. they really are able to push themselves beyond then of course we have or we have problems with psychopathic stuff where you don't feel anything at all yeah. um but uh you know a friend of mine I mean, he says you know oh i don't get you know like i've got to jump out of a plane or or, <laughs> or do some uh some amazing thing but i said to him one time i said uh, i know that's you know thrill seeking and i know that's pushing the envelope and i know that's putting yourself at risk but i also noticed that you wear a parachute <laughs> yes so so there there, there is that the, um, there is a clear divide between thrill seeking and death wish which is which is yeah. uh, and then we're moving yeah. to suicide and all kinds of other areas right so it's really but it's really yeah. interesting a lot of people think they're thrill seekers they just need additional stimulation in right. order to feel the sorts of uh, um uh passion that maybe uh, you know we just feel seeing a coiled up bit of rope <laughs> so 
certainly some of those freestyle climbers climbing without ropes uh, are at the uh, absolute you know extreme end of that spectrum yes, I, I think, love I their think enthusiasm I, I think i'm rather way towards the other the other extreme i i hate all of that stuff so anyway that's a great um that's a great summary of some of these uh middle of the brain subcortical regions next time we're gonna have a chat about some of the cortical regions yeah we will and of course remembering that what we're trying to say is that if you think about the behaviors and you think about the emotions that are coming through with people it can give you have a little you can just have a little think about in relation to an amygdala does this person have an oversensitive um, history of pattern recognition in relation to a particular particular pattern face shape which of course we know is based in in trauma <clears throat> Uh, is the hypothalamus having some trouble? How old are they? What are they? Has anyone had a stroke lately? Are they distributing the, the getting distribution through their brain of what they need? What's yeah. going on in the HPA axis? All these subcortical regions are what we call the more the implicit area, the non-conscious area. And we have the capacity to, as, as therapists, take the messages our client, the, the information our client is giving us, and just apply some of these possibilities in our assessment and our engagement with them. Fantastic. Well, thank you everybody for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy and we'll catch you next time. Bye for now.